Good evening. Welcome. I'm John. I'm the event director at Literati Bookstore. We're so pleased to welcome Michelle Murano in support of Like Love and joining her in conversation this evening, the Natalie Bacopoulos, the author of Scorpion Fish. A quick overview of webinars for those, those of you who are just joining us or have joined us late. The chat is closed this evening, but you may want to keep the chat window open during the event as I will be dropping links to purchase Like Love and Scorpion Fish from Literati. And if you're watching us later on YouTube, there are always links to purchase books uh, from the store in the description right below me. Make sure you also subscribe to our channel as well, and that way you'll never miss any of our events. And if you're watching live, of course, you can submit questions for the Q&A portion of our event using the Q&A feature available to you at the bottom of your screen at any time. And I will select uh, a few of those to read, time permitting, at the conclusion of the conversation this evening. And as a reminder, you can shop for more books at literatibookstore.com for curbside pickup if you live in Southeast Michigan or to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. In lieu of a book purchase, we'd also ask that you consider a $5 donation to sustain our virtual programming. So whether you'd like to think of that as this week's or this month's or this year's subscription to our programming, you can make a donation at literatibookstore.com slash donation. Otherwise, we simply thank you for your attendance this evening uh, or this morning or this afternoon, depending on where and when in the, in the world you may be joining us from. And now, without further ado, I'll introduce tonight's authors. Michelle Murano is the author of the travel memoir, Grammar Lessons, Translating a Life in Spain. Her essays and short fiction have appeared in many journals and anthologies, including Best American Essays, Fourth Genre, Ninth Letter, and Waveform, 21st century essays by women. She lives in Chicago where she chairs the English department at DePaul University. And Natalie Bacopoulos is the author of The Green Shore and her work has appeared in Tin House, The Ira Review, The New York Times, Granta, Plowshares, and The Penn O'Henry Prize Stories. She's an assistant professor of creative, write creative writing at Wayne State University in Detroit and a faculty member of the summer program Writing Workshops in Greece. She lives in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and her most recent novel is Scorpion Fish. They um, can't hear you, uh, but they can sense through the power of the internet. So please join me uh, in welcoming Michelle Morano and Natalie Bacopoulos into your living rooms. Thank you. Thank you, John, so much for that. Um, we're so happy to be here. And um, I think we'll start with uh, Michelle will read a little bit for us from uh, Like Love, her new collection of essays. Yes. First, I want to just say thank you so much to Literati and to Natalie for joining me. Um, yeah, I'm just very delighted to be here and to have this conversation with you. So I'll just start by saying that Like Love is an essay collection. It's really an essay, a memoir in essays that deals with um, various forms of unconsummated romance. So the kinds of crushes and infatuations and curious entanglements that we find ourselves getting into. So I'm gonna read uh, a bit from an essay called Ars Romantica or A Dozen Ways of Looking at Love. And this is about a kind of um, romance that I had with a landlord at one point, the kind of relationship that some of you might recognize of someone who you're not involved with, but you have this kind of intimacy that builds up. Um, so I'll just jump into this. Ben Bishop was a retired art professor who owned the house I shared with one man during the time I was seeing a second. The second man knew about the first, but not the other way around. And Ben Bishop knew about everything, but didn't mention it. We talked instead of our work, our travels. I had recently moved back to New York State from a year in Spain, which interested Ben because he'd once spent a summer with a woman in Malaga. The way his voice softened as he said this, eyebrows wrinkling above black framed glasses, told me it had been an unspeakable time, happy and sad, thrilling and dangerous. We became fast friends. In restaurants, I noticed others noticing us. Ben's white hair and mustache, my unwrinkled skin, our cocktails and laughter. And how could I fault their conclusions? We were dating, Ben and me, all through that fall and into the winter, a period of brilliant colors fading to shadows and light. 
Ben lived at the end of a long driveway in a ramshackle house filled with riches. He'd been a painter all his life until macular degeneration began to erase detail. Now he sculpted in a workshop off the living room where tables and shelves held large clay images. A life-sized hawk spread its wings, each feather responding to the wind. A curious child bent over a patch of grass. A three-foot-high bull with angular muscles and fearsome genitalia stood guard. I lived next door in a blue house with pink shutters. It was a fairy tale house backed into a steep wooden hillside, wooded hillside with many small rooms and a set of stairs so narrow we had to sidestep up and down. The man I lived with had moved into the house while I was in Spain as he finished the master's degree program where we'd met. Now, unable to find work in the Hudson Valley, he commuted to Long Island during the week and returned home each weekend. In contrast, I kept to a small local radius. Twice a week, I drove over the mountain to teach classes at the university, a nine mile route, both beautiful and harrowing. On the other days, I stayed at home, writing in a closet sized room overlooking the stream out front. On my home days, Ben sometimes called in the late afternoon, his voice gruff with the day's silence. Got anything in your fridge, sweetheart? He might have leftover lasagna and three oranges to which I'd add the makings of a salad and a bottle of wine. We'd agree to meet up at his place at six and from the moment I hung up the phone, the day shimmered. Loneliness evaporated, buoyancy took over. The last hour of work was the most productive of all. The walls of Ben's house were crowded with paintings, charcoal drawings, pencil and ink sketches. Most were gifts from friends around the world, artists who lived by their talents and gave plenty away. On each visit, Ben and I chatted through the rooms, the studio with its cool clay scent, the living room with layers of handmade rugs, the kitchen bursting with color, yellow walls, red cabinets, exposed pipes painted blue and green. Everywhere I looked were images worth lingering in front of, and Ben was always happy to lead a tour. In the dining room, we talked about the shading of a portrait at eye level. On the stairway, we leaned against the railing, admiring the work of a collage artist. Upstairs in Ben's bedroom, shelves beside the window held abstract rosewood sculptures, so smooth I couldn't help touching them. Mosquito netting curtained the unmade bed as if we lived in Zanzibar. Before dinner, we'd have two, maybe three martinis, then switch to whatever wine I'd brought, and later there would be a nightcap of brandy or cognac, more than I could drink in an evening before or since. Ben's gruff exterior softened with each pour, though he never seemed drunk, and I never felt that way. I felt charged up, connected to something I couldn't name. Ben asked questions and listened to the answers, both of us musing about books and movies and why people act the way they do. After we washed and dried the dishes and divided the leftovers, he'd walk me to the door and say, that was a good time, sweetheart, let's do it again. The walk home from the reach of Ben's porch light through darkness to the reach of my porch light felt magical. Partly it was the drinks and the way Ben conversed as if my life experience were on par with his, but mostly it was the studio, the walls, the sculptures and paintings and sketches, the intimacy of all that expression. This was years before researchers at the University of London learned that looking at an appealing work of art stimulates the same areas of the brain as having a crush on a person. Years before I began to understand why I'd float home from Ben's house feeling dizzy in love. I'd make a cup of tea and wrap in a blanket, then sit on the porch and look at the stars. Even when the temperature fell below freezing, I wanted to be out in the world, inhaling deeply, enjoying all that craving. I'll stop there. That's wonderful, Michelle. Thank you so much. Um, I love that you started, you began with that piece because um, you can't see it for people listening at home, but the, the essay is divided into 12 different ways of thinking about love to tell this story, right? Um, whether it's obsessive love, narrative love, secret love, uh, platonic love, uh, artistic love. Um, and I love the <clears> way <throat> you move through those different ways. And it seems almost as an ours, ours romantica, the art of romance, but it's also if we're thinking of what it's drawing on like an Ars Poetica, 
um, a, you know, a story about romance, a story about writing um, and the way art and love are linked. I thought that was so cool. Um, can you talk about the different, the different kinds of love that you structure in this essay and how this almost feels like a, a guide to reading the rest of the book in, in a sense, because all these kinds of love are, are also um, touched upon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really interesting. I hadn't thought of it that way. That's a great observation. Um, yeah. So I, you know, we were talking just before we started about how important structure is to each of us. And I always feel like I don't, I can't get into a piece fully until I understand its structure. Like I have to be able to almost visualize it or be able to draw out what it looks like, the chunks of it. And so I knew that this one was going to be chunky and I knew that I was going to be telling a certain kind of story and weaving in some research I had done about the neurochemistry of um, attraction and infatuation. Yeah. And um, but I didn't know how many uh, sections there were going to be. Oh. I thought there were going to be more. And then at a certain point, I thought there were going to be less. And so I kind of had that and I had these labels, these kind of adverbs that go along with different ways of looking. And, um, and it was really just a matter of writing and revising and honing those, um, the lenses, you know, for a while I had some blanks for the subtitles because I wasn't really, I knew what I was trying to do with the story, but I didn't really understand what I was trying to do in terms of another angle of looking at love. Um, oh, that's cool. yeah, it was kind of a trial and error process. And I even had a read a student research assistant for a while who came up with one of them. Oh, that's um, fantastic. Which one? Can you tell us? Uh, yes, it was the, um, let me see, it's toward, I feel like, so, so they're, you know, I'll just read them out so people know. Um, geometrically, artistically, platonically, biologically, linguistically, obsessive, obsessively, narratively, secretively, mythologically, I think it was then self-servingly, I think it was actually the um, ironically number 11. That's cool. Um, yeah. I like the way, I mean, often we think of these sorts of essays as the headings or the, 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 the scaffolding coming first, but it's almost as if you were building the building and then kind of putting the scaffolding on with it, right? Like sort of finding those things together. Which right. I think is probably more, um, true to how we actually work, like suddenly they converge, right? Those things. Yeah, and when I say that, like I find the structure, I don't, the, it's not set in stone, right? So yeah. that part of the revision process is honing that structure and figure, and then sometimes you get rid of the structure altogether. Does that ever happen with you? If you have an artificial structure? Always, I mean, and I then think- that, yeah. the piece grows it, yeah. Always, I think Zadie Smith talks about how she has to um, build the scaffolding of her novel because it's the only thing that gives her any confidence to work. I'm like, if Zadie, if Zadie Smith needs this, like, right. you know, but um, but that gives her confidence to work, and then she eventually kind of tears it down, or, or maybe she doesn't, but she feels like she has to operate within that to get her ideas flowing, and then she kind of uh, once she finds the story, she takes it down. And I yeah. think that I think that for novelists or for essayists, um, but especially like this is an essay that reminds me of like is the external structure actually shows with the the different ways right the 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 headings, right. right, yeah, right. And it's so interesting that you know these these structures and these ways of thinking about experience are belong wholly to the writer, you know. Like it's I wasn't thinking like this at all during the period that I'm describing. Right. Um, although I think I'm capturing something true about that period that myself at the time might have agreed with, you know, but I didn't have access to this way of thinking at that time. Yeah, I love that. I mean, I love that about um, any kind of uh, first person narration in particular, but any kind of narration where there's the there's the I who tells the story and then the I who was there before and those two are, are merging. And I love the way those two are. I mean, you can you can see the I, I mean it in a, like when there's the artifice of, for instance, there's an essay where you're talking about um, leaving 
your home with your, your mother and your brother and leaving your father at home. And then you're talking about breaking back into that house. And mm -hmm. I love the way the back and forth goes of the, the narrative of leaving and the narrative of trying to get back in and this kind of push pull or in and out that I thought was also very interesting. And that seemed like it establishes almost a musicality or a rhythm once you get into it, that that's going on, but it, it creates a great tension between uh, two different narratives in one essay. I, I love that choice to put those together. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, can I ask another question about the title? Please. Okay. Yes. So the t I love titles and I have a lot of trouble with titles. And so the title Like Love um, does so many cool things. And also the title essay Like Love seems to be kind of anchoring the book in, in a certain way, or maybe the title's pointing to it. Um, the idea that it's something is like love or something uh uh, we love, we like love uh -huh. and also the, um, uh, the white space between like and love. And I feel like that's to me the most, the, what is in the white space, whether any kind of narrative or a poem is so interesting. And this book seems to explore the white space, even in what is told and what is not told. Mm -hmm. like that. Can, can you talk about that a little bit or how you, might yeah, I think that's really true. And I think that so much for me, so much of writing is overwriting and then carving back, like getting it out there so that I can figure out what is the what's the stuff that shimmers on the page and then how much can I carve away um, so that it can do its work without my all of my thought process being there on the page with it and I do think you know there's this there's this way also that for me the title works I think sometimes we confuse intense like for love <laughs> And we allow ourselves or we, um, that sounds too strong, but we kind of get swept away in this, in the very pervasive romance narratives that, that are around us all the time. And um, so it's been really interesting for me to just think about how normal it is, for example, to develop crushes on other people and to feel that sort of pull and to realize that it doesn't necessarily mean anything in terms of one's behavior or one's future or relationships it's possible just to enjoy those crushes yeah. and to know that that's a, a form of intense like that is its own thing but that doesn't necessarily move into love you know yeah. Yeah, and I and I but I love the way that the book also gives space for that story because so much about when we think of and we'll talk about probably about love stories too because there's even an essay where you say this is not a love story uh -huh. and I'm like that's kind of a love story right? <laughs> um, but like what we decide what we decide is a love story seems to have an end point but right. stories don't even have end points like books right. just end right and I love that idea of this this process of becoming and it's almost, I mean, you said that this is kind of a memoir in essays and mm -hmm. there's a sense of you kind of moving towards something, but not so much an end point, but like a becoming or a, a sense right. of something. I love that so much. Um, yeah. Were you thinking about, I don't know, those things in, in the chronology or in, in how you were putting the essays together or how you were writing each essay or? Yeah, I guess I was thinking about it a little bit as a coming of ages story, yeah. you know, that that we think of coming of age as being, you know, that sort of movement from childhood and, or adolescence into adulthood, as though adulthood were this monolithic, monolithic stage. But in fact, there are many stages that are part of adulthood and also adolescence in our whole lives. And so this idea, like, I, I still don't feel I still feel very much like I'm in the, sometimes I have to pause and go like, you really are too old now to be like <laughs> coming into your own, you know? But it does still feel like that, weirdly. Like I'm, I'm still like find, finding my way and kind of feeling my way into who I'm becoming. So um, yeah, I was definitely aware of that. And then I also think there are stages and this is, this, I'm gonna make a segue into your book because I really want to talk about Sparkle okay. too. But it's, I was thinking a lot today actually in prep preparation for this uh, visit about your main character, Mira, who um, returns to Athens after the death of her parents, right? To a place mm -hmm. that she's from. I'm just giving a little summary of the story. Thank you, sure, yeah. I'm audience. so bad at summarizing my own work. So thank okay, you. well, correct me if I get anything wrong, but she returns in order to, well, 
Um, to spend a summer in the place where she was born and lived till she was five years old. She's returning to the family apartment that's now hers. Mm -hmm. um, she's also there to spend time with her um, boyfriend who that's not going to end very well. But, um, but it's, it, she's really in this new stage of life, right? The stage of being an adult without parents and of being the person who's responsible for herself um, and who has these properties and things and who is kind of, it seems to me feeling her way around what it means not only to live in this loss, but also to live with this new version of herself that has no parents, right? And Absolutely. so, yeah. And so, I mean, that's part of what's underneath a lot of this book too, is that I'm in that stage now of both of my parents have passed on. And I think it just creates this real, um, no matter how old you are when it happens, it creates this real occasion for introspection and reflection yeah. about who you are and who you want to be. <laughs> if we're always in the process of becoming ideally someone we want to be. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to like segue and talk a little bit about Scorpion Fish and about that character and how you developed her and how you created the structure of the book, which has dual narratives. Oh, let's talk about structure first, I yeah. think, because I think the structure is um, how I found the book. And so um, Scorpion Fish is narrated by two narrators, Mira, who we talked about, um, and she has a next door neighbor named the captain. And they live in an apartment building in Athens and uh, it's separated, the, their balconies are separated by a very thin opaque wall, which is very common in, in Athens. And so they can hear each other on the other side, but they never see each other, but they start having these conversations. And the book is kind of anchored by their two voices. Um, but when you're on a balcony, you can both, you're, you're both public and private, mm -hmm. right? You can, you can, people, other people can hear you, but they're not supposed to hear you or they're not supposed to chime in. And so you hear what other people are doing, this communal living, but you don't actually, um, you know, you're not really part of that conversation. So it's like this public and private conversation happening where someone underneath them could probably be listening in. And so mm -hmm. I wanted the book to feel like almost like an eavesdropping of these two conversations. Um, there's a Greek poet named Odysseus, uh, Odysseus Elitis, who has a, some poems called the Maria Nefeli poems. And it's a, a younger woman and, and the older poet in conversation back and forth. It's mm -hmm. like a call and response. And so once I realized, I realized oh, that's what I wanna do, then the structure fell into place. Um, and so that's where I found that. And just the idea of um, uh, what, what happens with grief. Jasmine Ward has this great line about um, when, when somebody you love dies, the grief, you, the love you have for them does not die. And grief is learning to live with that love. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, in, you know, your book reminds me of this so much too, about the way that love, even love with no, what does love with no object feel like? And sometimes that feeling is there, like you say about travel is about falling in love. Well, with who, with a country, with a place, with who you are in that place, right? So this idea of just falling in love is not always with, with an object, right? It could be just the subject, right? Right, yeah, that sometimes there isn't a width to the falling in love. There isn't a width, yeah, right. there isn't a width. It's just uh -huh. like falling in love. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, I guess I was thinking about different kinds of ways also of loving and, and falling in love there. And, I, and you have an essay in your book about um, living in, in Iowa City and living in a, a, one of those houses with three apartments inside mm -hmm. and the kind of comfort of that communal living where you hear what's going on and this person's playing this instrument or this person's you know doing whatever, but it's not so much eavesdropping as sort of shared space. Um, and, and I was thinking a lot about, I mean, the, our, I feel like so much about our books are in conversation in different ways, even though we weren't writing them together, obviously. Yeah. And I was thinking too, though, uh, about intimacy, you know, your book is so, and I just cannot recommend this book enough. It's especially for reading during the pandemic. It just is so fantastic because you can travel, <laughs> you know, you can have those experiences, <clears throat> excuse me, of, um, you know, just reminding me of all the things that I miss of like these um, impromptu get togethers where you meet up with someone on the street and you go, oh, let's stop and have a drink and a little bite to eat. And, you know, there's just this kind of, and also it's very Mediterranean because it takes place in Greek. And so there's that sense of always having a drink and a little bit of food that's delivered to you. So there's, it's just this ritual, you know, it's interesting because 
we have some family coming into town later this week and they wanted to get together with us. And we're really, you know, careful about this. So we've decided that we're probably gonna get to see each other, but masked and it just feels so wrong not to be able to have a drink of something together or eat a little bit, you know, just these rituals that we have around social connection that are absent, not wholly absent, but it's the spontaneity, I think that I miss most of all. And this book is so beautifully full of that with so much great food and drink in it. And the intimacy that develops around um, those social rituals. I mean, what you were saying about the balconies, I think is so beautiful, that sense of like living together and apart and knowing things about other people that you kind of pretend that you don't know. Um, but that might lead someone. I knew always when my um, neighbor was heartbroken, oh, you know, wow. I could yeah. hear her. And so I didn't ever go over and say, I'm sorry, but you know, I bought something, you know, left flowers outside of her door. I did, you know, you make little gestures because you have this intimate knowledge. She did similar things for me. And so I think there is this really lovely way that, um, yeah, that we do live communally as much as in this country, we love that sense of individualism and, and try to ignore that fact. There's a sense of uh, those kind of things are little ruptures too. And it seems like, I mean, uh, you could look at all the essays in this book as these little ruptures of like, when is that person going to like, whether it's making a move, like a, a move towards something physical or mm -hmm. to say something or to leave a message on a machine or to address something, um, you know, or even, I, I mean, I, like um, the idea that the the, mo the mother in your, your, your mother, it's nonfiction, sorry, mm -hmm. in my book, it's the mother, but in your book, it's, it's your mother. <laughs> yeah. um, and the way that she is the one, I mean, there's, there's the constant of, um, you, you name your partner, Kevin, uh, the, mm -hmm. the constant of Kevin in the book. And there's also the constant of your mother. Mm -hmm. And there's an essay where they converge also as sort of the, I don't know, the two not that the other lives are lesser, other loves are lesser, but there's these two big loves of your life that are literally kind of vying for space in, in, yeah. in this book. And the way they interact, I think, says something really interesting. Um, and, and you mentioned after your, your was, I was wondering if you're, how many of these essays were written after your um, mother had died and how many of them were, how much of them was about grief and how much was about sort of something else, I think. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I don't, let's see, I'd have to count up. Some of them were um, written before she died. A couple of them that involve her, I think maybe two that involve her, were actually published before she died, though she never uh, read them to my knowledge. Yeah. Um, but I think even when she was alive, there was a lot of grief that yeah. This comes out so beautifully. That relationship. Yeah, there was a kind of big rupture between us that um, we kind of repaired for a little while, but not fully because my mother was always somebody who did not want to live in the past mm -hmm. unless it was her <laughs> living in the past. So if you try to address the past at all, it's like, no, 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 you got to move forward. Don't live in the past. Um, and so I really feel like if you don't not live in the past, but if you don't address discuss, bring some things out into the light, it's really hard to move beyond that. And so that's kind of where we were stuck. Um, and it's interesting because I learned a lot, I think writing this book and, you know, I always say in nonfiction that it kind of keeps you honest, knowing that you're writing about people who are potentially gonna read it. Mm -hmm. And um, so I wrote about a couple of people in this um, book who have passed and thought initially like, okay, it should be easier now, right? <laughs> because I know they can't argue with me over what happened. But in fact, I think it was harder because I felt more of a, um, an obligation or responsibility to yeah. be really fair and to look take a hard look at my own behavior and my own complicity in certain situations. And, um, but, but in the process of creating my mother on the page and particularly in that essay 
that you referenced where she and Kevin come together. It's the longest essay in the book by far. It's kind of a really pivotal, it's the one that takes place in Iowa City. Um, and I feel like when I finished that, I understood something about what I always wanted to be able to say to my mother yeah. that I didn't understand when she was alive. And it's hard to know, you know, when she was alive, it's also possible that just the fact of her death has allowed me to arrive at that, at that place because it's been a while now since I've engaged with her um, as a person. So it's hard to say exactly what allowed that, but I do think sometimes that, um, you know, it's that old hindsight thing. You understand how to interact with someone once it's no longer possible to interact with them. Sure. Yeah, and there's there's a. It seems like there's a, a moment where um, Kevin says something in the in the essays that's very kind of respectful toward your mother, but also healing. I think in a sense, and I, I, that moment just seems to be this oh moment that that almost the book feels like it's reeling toward. Um, yeah. And then you become a mother, and and then right. there's this other narrative, this other this other kind of love that sort of repeats itself. But I, every, I feel like every love in this book is kind of the spiraling that you're going toward, not like toward one final thing, but constantly this this becoming that you were talking about and the structure of the book I think so beautifully reflects that I just I, I can't recommend this book enough for um, people who are you know if people are interested thank it's you a wonderful collection well, yeah uh, going off of that I, I wanted to say something that I think applies to both of our books which is has to do with the cyclical nature of both love and grief yeah you know um the way that when when you grieve I think you're often grieving the immediate loss and all the previous losses as well. So I think that's why sometimes people fall apart completely when like their bird dies, right? Or <laughs> some, I mean, an animal that many of us would think a guinea pig or something where we think, well, you didn't have it for that long, you know, how could it have been that deep? But sometimes it's just the compounding nature of the grief and and I think something similar happens or can happen with love. And so I feel like in your book, that was kind of happening on both counts that Mira is dealing with this grief and then the grief is getting compounded by the situation with her boyfriend, by the situation with her aunt. Um, and also there's this love that's emerging as well and this ability to love freely in a place that had been very complicated for her in the past. That's, I think that's a really wonderful um, commentary on it and thinking and just thinking about the way love um, is, is working in this book, in my book. And also I think in many ways in your book, um, the way that um, I, I kept wanting to think about love in the most kind of open-hearted, kind, Mm -hmm. unjudgmental way that kind of transcends boundaries, crosses boundaries, allows for autonomy and vulnerability or independence. And um, I think often, for, especially for female narrators, they, they, we want them to be independent. And, but independent doesn't mean without relation or without, re without things that are relational. We just don't always want to be defined only relationally, right? And, and so I was thinking, I, I think Mira in this book is thinking about, you know, what does it mean to go through the world alone? What does it mean to go through the world with love and how do you keep you, the boundaries of yourself intact while still allowing people in. Um, and I think, you know, like love is doing this um, in many ways too, right? Like, what does it mean to, how we love the way we are seen when we fall in love or when we're infatuated or when we like someone. And I think so much of this book is you being seen in a way that maybe you weren't as a younger person, whether mm -hmm. your your parents or or, or 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 younger younger loves that didn't sort of see you in the same way. Yeah, I think that's actually yeah, that's a really good good observation. I think that's true. And also, though, thinking about like female identity for me, you know, the identity of mother and of all the expectations for maternal love and um, maternal instincts. Uh, felt incredibly oppressive you know uh when I got pregnant and this was considerably later than most women do I there was part of me that just thought oh my god I'm doing the most cliched thing possible <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, 
I'm becoming a mother. And what is that going to mean? You know, and I was very concerned. I had a friend years ago who was super um, uh, ambivalent about becoming a mom and, you know, was already planning it from the moment she got pregnant that she was only breastfeeding for a short time because she wanted her body back. And then she had this baby and just went off the deep end, became like a mother who homeschooled four children who didn't want them out of her sight. She just, and I was desperately afraid, afraid that was going to happen to me, that I was going to lose myself. That is not at all what happened. And I think I was never in danger of that, but it just was, there's just so many, you know, overpowering um, narratives, again, in the same that we, way that we have them for love, we have them for parenting, I think, and mothering. You, especially. Yeah. And the way, I mean, though, and the way that even the way we talk about motherhood is so often sentimentalized in, in these kind of sometimes I think harmful ways to, to mothers because of the expectation. And we don't talk about fatherhood that way. The guy shows up and takes the kid to soccer camp and everyone's like, hooray, great father, right? But the way we talk about motherhood is, is with such high stakes. Right. Um, and I love the way you kind of break that down a little bit and think about, you know, you say in the book that you want to look at the, the mystery of love through a rational lens. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I love the way you do that. And also sometimes you look at the more rational things through a sort of mysterious lens. And I think that's a really, really cool how you, how you do that in, in this yeah, book, not just you. about motherhood, but, but definitely right. about motherhood. Right. Yeah. I think that's true. I think that's true. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see. Should we take some questions or I, I might have another um, question for you? Um, if, if not, I definitely, yeah. We don't have any questions just yet, so I'll, I'll remind folks that they can use the Q&A feature to submit any questions they might have. So Natalie, I might toss it back over to you for maybe one more question, and then I'll jump back on. We have a couple more questions in the Natalie, can I point okay. out, can I share with people just a little, a, a little moment in your book that I love so much? Sure. Um, uh, one of many, but... Um, it's a quote in uh, one of the sections told by the captain. Okay. And he says, I have always thought loyalty a strange thing. We think it has to do with history, with oath, but it is nothing of the sort. It's an impulse. I just, that really like made me sit up and because you're writing about, you know, Greek, a Greek culture in which family and family connections and the kind of long-standing sense of who you are is so important. And there's a, an, a loyalty that goes along with that. Yeah. And then this I thought was such an interesting twist on that. Um, oh, I just you. wondered if you, I don't know if I have a question even, but just, is there anything you wanna, you wanna say about that, about his perspective? I, well, I do think, I mean, I think loyalty and obligation are sometimes linked in, in different ways. And I think that I think for Mira, like she's feeling kind of, uh, she was always felt kind of obligated to her parents, also loyal to them, but she felt as often the child of immigrants might feel when they're the ones kind of navigating the culture that she becomes another spouse or mm -hmm. she's kind of navigating the world for them. But I think for the, um, the idea of, there's an idea of the sort of, Greek family as this ideal and, and, and Greeks are close to their families and all this, but there's a lot of unspoken, you know, repression and oppression that can happen in those families. There's a, a huge patriarchal structure. There's only certain kinds of lives that are, are, are sanctioned. And I was thinking about women who are moving through the world in this Greek space, um, making their own way in the world and kind of pushing back those things, but still affected by those kind of more oppressive structures. Um, as for the captain and, and loyalty, I think I think he's trying to think about what does it mean to be, you know, what does it mean to be a man who's who's married and with children, but those people might not need him anymore. And to whom is he loyal and and to what? Um, and so I think that's kind of what he's he's kind of wrestling with with this idea of what it means to to be what what it means to what it means to be loyal, I guess, or what it means to feel um, not just obligated, but kind of connected in, in, in these ways to your histories and both his, his, his wife is, or his ex-wife, his father, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And there's a beautiful strand having to do with belonging to, you know, in Mira, in terms of where does she belong in the U.S. and in Greece, but also in terms of 
the captain, well, there's the strand of the refugee crisis in Greece mm -hmm. that is just handled so beautifully. And it intersects Mira's story and it intersects the captain's story too, yeah. because he actually has some trouble with his, with his position, his work, his, his piloting of ships right. that's connected to that. Right. Um, and it just, I just, yeah, I just thought that that notion of loyalty was really interesting given various people's perspectives on what it means to welcome people from other cultures who are oh, in crisis yeah. or not. Yeah, and that, country, that really, right? that's a great observation, Michelle. Thank you for that because he really, he, you know, he should be loyal to his job or maybe loyal to the rules as a captain or loyal to his country or whatever. But really his, his impulse was to be a humanitarian in a way that defied laws. Um, but it was, the, he felt like it was the right choice, but the choice that might haunt him, you know, as, right. or, or, or stay with him. And right. so for him, that was an impulse, a loyalty to, you know, humanness, I guess, or, or humanity as opposed to history. Um, and I think, I think those things, you know, to, to what are we loyal? There's a, there's the, do you know the essay is Catherine Chetkovich? Oh yeah. Uh -huh. she, she has an essay called Envy and, and she has a line in there that says, who are we here for others or ourselves? And I feel like everything I write, that's behind everything that I'm thinking about. Who are we here for others or ourselves? And, and, and how, what, what is the line between those two things? And I think I was thinking about that when I wrote this book. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, John. Hi, so we do have a question um, from our friend Jeremiah Chamberlain, uh, who writes, huge fan of Michelle's work as an essayist. Earlier in this conversation, she said that, quote, structure belongs wholly to the writer compared to the individual who lived the experience. I wonder if Michelle would meditate a bit on how she sees structure as a tool to mediate and translate between the writer's inquiry and excavation of the past and the lived experience. In short, I'm curious about going beyond structure as organizing tool to think about meaning making. Yeah, that's a great question. And thank you for giving me an opportunity to say a little bit more about that because I think it might have, it could have come off as a little too surface level. So I think, um, yeah, I think structure is really important and I'm a big fan of different kinds of structures. Um, but I think where structure can go wrong is when a writer comes up with a really cool structure for the sake of doing something cool and imposes it upon um, a subject matter. So for me, it's all, I'm always trying to figure out what structure can I develop that's going to assist whatever experience or whatever inquiry I'm working on and not be there for itself, right? So it has to feel organic. And sometimes there's just, I mean, that, that super long essay about my mother coming to visit Iowa City, right, as I was starting to become involved with Kevin is a pretty straightforward narrative. You know, it's in sections. There's a little bit of moving back flashbacks and stuff, but it, it kind of moves along. It doesn't do anything flashy. In part, that's because there was a lot going on in that essay. I was trying to, and so I think almost you can, do I want to say this? I'm going to say this and I'm going to decide if I agree with it. I think that structure, the complexity of structure almost has to have an inverse relationship to the complexity of the subject matter. Ah, oh, interesting. Right? Because if you have a really complex subject and a really complex structure, there's a lot that can go wrong there. But if it's a relatively straightforward story that you're telling, like the one in Ars Romantica, it, it's not, I mean, yeah, okay, there was, there was a triangle, a, really a, a, a rectangle in certain ways, if we want to include Landlord Ben. But it wasn't, there wasn't a lot of super complicated material there. So I was freer, I think to play around with, well, what does it mean to, to look at love artistically when I'm writing about an artist and my, you know, sort of infatuation with him was partly due to um, his being an artist. Um, 
Whereas some of the other structures, I feel, yeah, I mean, there are a couple of essays. There's one that's in the second person. There's the last one is in the third person. Um, so perspective can be part of it as well. That kind of inter intersects with, um, with structure to some degree. But I think it is really important that the structure be a tool for excavating meaning and not something that gets overlaid. I think that's really interesting about that essay in particular, because that essay, um, it takes place over the um, two, either the mother's impending arrival and then the two weeks of, or however many days of, I think it's yeah. two weeks yeah. of her visit. So there's a very set, the, it's already, the material has given you a very set narrative of time, mm -hmm. but then within that time, you're do, there is so much else going on. And that's just kind of the, this kind of the steady structure within to work, but really you're looping through all of this stuff. Right. So yeah. I think that's really interesting the way that the, that relationship, you could, you could write that out and, uh, and, and we could quote you all over the place with, with that one about the inverse relationship. Yeah, I think, I mean, I'm sure that you know, later tonight, I'll think of examples that don't fit that model. But I think that's, I think that's good advice for writers is to think about, you know, the complexity, yeah, the complexity of subject and the complexity of form, and then try to modulate them one to yeah. the other. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. And you can think about that in, in, in fiction and poetry and any anything any writing that takes a form which is all of it even if it's kind of the anti-form or the count, counter uh, narrative or something like that right although I think I don't know do you think that maybe poetry allows for a little more complexity on both levels because of the amount of white space yeah maybe yeah yeah just the amount there's not there's it, there's a small space there John's a poet he might have an answer for us there <laughs> Don't put me on the spot. My two prose writers talk about poetry. My muscles have atrophied in that regard. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, no, go well, ahead. I was going to say one more thing about the. Um, there's another one essay we haven't talked about talked about so much, but it's how to tell a true love story, mm -hmm. and the title seems to be maybe echoing Tim O'Brien's how to tell a true war story. But then also, I kept getting caught on the words true love next to each other also like it's a true story it's a true love story it's a true love story uh -huh. um, and you keep going through like where should I begin how should I tell that story and it throws everything everything we've read so far into wait is this how much of this is being told you know the, the we want to believe that the narrator is telling us the truth so to speak but then where a story ends and where a story begins even if it all happened also shapes it and mm -hmm. so um, if, if maybe if you could say a few words about that essay in particular, how to tell a true love story. Right, well, that's an interesting piece because it's actually about an ex okay. romantic partner. Um, and the so the romance I'm writing about is not from the primary relationship, but it's the kind of the after romance, the, after romance. the way we maintained a friendship over 15 years until he committed suicide. Um, we maintained a friendship that was um, very romantic, um, but but not at all involved in a romantic way. And so, and it was almost like freeing once we were no longer partners that we could indulge when we, you know, we, we would walk down the street, he would put his arm around me, you know, it, to anyone looking at us, we would seem like a couple when we were together mm -hmm. um, because we were freer to do that. And there was no, um, no, none of the kind of rancor that came initially with a breakup. And so it was, I mean, that's really an, a piece that's about in part um, how and when do we feel secure in a relationship because we think that it is a permanent one, like that yeah. this is going to be a lifelong relationship, you know, and, and that for me, that was it. That was like, okay, this is a relationship I'm always going to be able to count on. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, uh, you know, all, uh, but he, he really struggled with mental illness and that went out at a certain point. So yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. You know, with, yeah. well, with that one though, it's interesting because Partly what I was in trying to construct that one in the second person and to make it into the how to tell a true, you know, that kind of um, almost like a pedagogical essay. Here's how you do this sort of thing or here's how you don't do it. The, the trick for me was 
it's a grief story and how do you make it new? Yeah. You know, how do you, how do you tell this story in a way you know, it's kind of like Tim O'Brien going, how do you write about the Vietnam War? It's been done to death. Yeah. You know, how do I make anybody pay attention to that? Well, I start talking about the things they carried. I start talking about, you know, just the, the kind of mundane aspects of it. Um, and so that's what it was for me. It was kind of like really trying to think about foregrounding the choices that we make and the dilemmas that we face and trying to tell a story that's kind of an overdone story in a way. Yeah, and, yet and where still- the love story begins and ends, because you said it begins, in some ways it begins after, right? Or it begins, like the, right. there's a second love story of, of after, after love, right. which is love also. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. And in some ways it's a much deeper and um, more almost verging on familial. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's lovely. It's it's a lovely book. That it's a lovely collection. It works as a collection. It works as a memoir. It works as you know a store a, a, a book about love. Which if you told someone I'm writing a book about love, I'd say what? Right. right I know. Roll your eyes. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> I think I know how that goes. <laughs> I always am surprised that a lot of times my students will say, "Well, I don't want to write about love," and I'll say, "Why not?" There's I don't know. It's so cliche. I'm like, but yeah, but what else is there? I mean, love is everything. But then also, even if they say, I don't know anything about love, like that's a great in to a story, right? right. I know nothing about love is also also something to think about. What does that mean to know or not right. know about love? Yeah. But it's also, it's just never true. Yeah, right. It's never true. I mean, we, we experience love or um, we think about it from very early on and we're surrounded by cultural um, indoctrination into how to love and whom to love. Um, and so I think, I think most everyone knows more than they initially under, you know, initially think yeah. um, about it. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Michelle, I- it was wonderful. Do we have any other questions? If not, should we? No, there's, there's, there's no other questions. Michelle, were you, were you going to? I was actually just going to, Nellie, just ask you one quick question about genre, uh, about genre. Okay. Because this is, um, I'm going to hold it up again. It's so beautiful. This is um, a work of fiction. (laughs) And I know that it contains a character who is based on your aunt. Right. You also have written about her in nonfiction. So I just wondered if you wanted to say anything about the different depictions according to genre. Yeah, I think the in Scorpion Fish, the woman, her name is Nefeli, is kind of inspired by a sort of emotional truth about my aunt um, who, but nothing really true about it. I mean, there's some little details about um, her becoming ill and things like that, which happens to the character in the book. But this, my aunt was not an artist. Um, She was a, a, a tour guide and a scholar. Um, this the woman in the book is a is a is a um, an artist. But there was something about the the her narrative of of being gay, being queer, and not being seen in the certain culture that that Nefeli feels that inspired me, and that was kind of inspired by my aunt. Um, but thinking about that allowed me to sort of allow I, I was allowed to tell the story first in fiction and kind of use a kind of an emotional truth to tell the story. Um, like Peter Ho Davies says that a story in, in his new book, um, his new book, A Lie Someone Told You About Yourself, he says, um, uh, a story can be 99% true and 1% false or, or made up or 1% made up and 99% true and nobody knows the difference. And in this case, I took just a tiny kind of tr- a kernel of the truth and took it there. Um, and that allowed me to kind of open up to decide to write the nonfiction version, the, the true version, so to speak, or one, one approach to it, I think by writing through the fiction first, so, but they're definitely related. That's so interesting. I'm really glad you said that because I, I love that idea of fiction as a way of writing toward nonfiction potentially. Yeah. Yeah. yeah or you could, or the, or the other way could happen too. You know? Yeah. 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 We have time for one more question and, and uh, Miles Harvey has written in um, that his students are currently discussing setting at the moment. Um, and I was wondering if both of you can discuss the ways that setting creates character um, in your work? Oh, that's a good one. That is a really good question. Yeah. Michelle, do you want, do you have a, a thought on that? Yeah. So I think yeah. for, 
well, again, genre comes up for me here because I'm writing setting. And I think in some, you know, some of the settings are sort of places that I fell in love with, you know, or that I have deep connections to. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I feel like in nonfiction, I'm using setting to, um, to recreate uh, a particular time of my life and a particular set of experiences. And also to create, recreate a mindset, you know, of like, just so I'm very, very sensitive to place. And so I'm always thinking about my relationship to wherever I am. So it kind of comes up naturally. Um, and then it's just a matter of, um, of using enough details and selecting the right details to make it come alive for readers as well. But I imagine it's different. Um, in, and set, setting is so huge in this novel, Natalie. Yeah, I mean, the setting is Athens and also an unnamed island that the narrators go back and forth between. Um, and so the kind of geopolitical complexity of what's going on in Greece at the time, the setting is, say, like maybe a few years ago, um, really kind of informs the narrative, but also just the way both narrators are speaking, who are both kind of very influenced by their space, whether it's being out at sea or being in an apartment or the setting of the balcony. And I think of, you know, setting and character is kind of tied in that, that the way the character is experiencing the world is part of the setting and the way the character is aware of the setting and what they notice and what they don't, what they choose to see and what they don't. And so I try to think of setting and um, I used to think of it as a separate thing. Like I would teach a section on setting and then and like, well, it's nice to think about setting in fiction or nonfiction, but really it's about the way the character navigates that setting um, and how they sort of experience a, a sort of certain awareness of the setting. And so that I've been thinking more about it in that way through the lens of whoever is doing the narration. Mm, I like that idea that setting is, is a kind of a tool for character development. Yeah, I guess it could be a nonfiction too. I mean, the yeah. way it acts on character. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. Yeah. Thanks, Miles, for that question. Yeah. Thank you both um, for joining us for now at the top of the hour. Um, so I think it's time to go. But Michelle Morano, Natalie Bacopoulos, thank you so much for being here at, at Home of Literati tonight. Um, it was so wonderful to have you. And I uh, hope we can have you in this store uh, for new books sometime soon. Um, but until they'll, until then, please continue to stay safe and be well. And to our attendees, thank you so much for joining us this evening as well. We, we hope you continue to stay safe and be well. And we'll see you at the next event. So good night, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Thank you so much. Michelle, it was so great, great to talk to with you. you. I've just yeah. loved your work for so long. And it's, it's such an here. honor. Yeah. Same here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I thank look forward to getting together before too long. Me too. And thank you, John. Thank you, Literati. Yeah, Take care, always. all. Good night. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Bye.